Um, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, I'm Aaron Shaw. Uh, I'm going to be sharing and tag teaming this talk with Benjamin Mako Hill, who's right there. So we'll be bouncing back and forth. Um, we are talking about that, uh, although our title changed and I forgot to update that. So, oh well. Anyway, this is about social awards and promoting collaboration. Um, and eventually it's going to be about barn stars. So put your barn star temporary tattoos on if you got one of those and get ready. Um, so the, the sort of starting point for this talk is there's a whole lot of social science theories out there and just kind of intu intuitions that we have about what kinds of tools and incentive schemes can promote collaboration. Um, and so this is, a pre in this presentation, we're going to talk about three studies that the both of us have done. We're both uh, PhD students at the moment in sociology programs in different places. Um, and uh, the three studies are going to come from three different field sites. Uh, the first is going to look in a crowdsourcing work, a crowdsourcing market. Um, the second is going to look at a, at a remixing community that Mako is going to talk about. And then the final one is going to look at the English language Wikipedia. Um, and so the first, uh, these are these were pub these are going to be out as three separate papers. Um, so we're bringing them together to really try to encompass what we've been working on related to this issue of awards and incentives for collaboration as a whole. So study number one is a study of crowdsourcing that I did together with some collaborators, John Horton and Daniel Chen. Um, and uh, the paper was presented at the Conference on Computer Supported Cooperative Work uh, last March. Um, and really, the starting point for this paper is this question of how do you elicit high quality work from workers in a crowdsourcing market? And I'll come back to the point that crowdsourcing is really different from other kinds of collaboration in a minute. Um, but the big question here is, is you know, you've got this environment where, in theory, you're trying to get people to contribute work to some collective product and contribute work of reasonably high quality. And because it's these micro task markets um, like Amazon's Mechanical Turk, if you're familiar with that, um, where you're paying tiny amounts of money for tiny amounts of labor, um, oftentimes the sort of social interaction is really small. And so you have very little to kind of go on other than seemingly other than money to get people to work well together. Um, so there's been some work, though, that you know, suggests that things like awards uh, can do something for people. Um, but my collaborators and I, since we didn't really know what we were looking at in this case, um, and since we all came from different fields, I'm in sociology and one of them was an economist and one of them had more of a background in psychology, we thought we would just throw a whole bunch of different incentive schemes at these workers. Um, and we would try a whole lot of them around the same kind of task so that we could measure their performance on a single outcome, on a single kind of measure. Um, so in this case, what we did is the, the experiment was these 14 different incentive schemes um, and we had sort of modified framing text. So basically we said things like, uh, I'll explain them in a second, but the basic idea is we modified the same task with some different text around it before they did the task to see if the text would elicit different quality work out the other side, right? Oh, and it's important to note that we knew the answers ahead of time to our questions, so they, that's how we could measure how many they got right out of five. Um, so this was done with workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, which if you haven't seen it, recommend checking it out, it's kind of interesting. Um, and these were all the treatments we did, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but the important thing is sort of down there at the bottom, where it says that some of these are more just purely financial incentives, right? If you do your work well, you pay you more, or if you do your work worse, we'll pay you less. Um, some of them were straight up social psychological, so think, saying things like, we trust you, here's the code you can use to get paid for this task, now please do it as best you can, right? Um, and some were doing things like trying to prime people to see if they would uh, respond to primings about hard work as an important value. Um, and I always try to be honest when I do hard work and seeing if that affected how well they completed the task at the other side. Um, so that gives you a sense of some of these. Um, I'll come back to, the, to some of the weirder ones in a second because it turns out that they're important to our results. Um, so like I said, it's just framing text. And apologies, because it's a little small for you to read in the back there. But uh, basically, this is one that's that framing, <coughs> that framing that I described, where it's like we're asking people whether they think that people who don't work become lazy before they do this test, to see if priming them for attitudes about hard work <coughs> would elicit higher quality participation. Um, and so once we did all this, and I'm just kind of rushing through this, because we got a few of these to go through. Um, what you can see here is this is the outcome here is measured on a score out of five. Um, so this, is, this range is really covering two to about 
Um, and what you can see is that for some of these ones towards the bottom here, these ones that involve trust and that like priming about their attitudes about work, um, and some kind of cheap talk one where we sort of said like, hey, we're watching you to make sure you do good work, that didn't do anything different from control. That got the same score as control. In fact, the only two that got a score that was significantly different from control, when you do some tests for significance on these results, are those top two. This one called Bayesian Truth Serum and this Punishment for Agreement Condition. So the Bayesian Truth Serum Condition was one that basically asked the workers to not only give us their response, but also to predict what responses other workers would give. So in other words, if I asked you, uh, you know, uh, how many jelly beans are in this jar, and I asked you to give me your answer, and then I asked you to give me the most popular answer, or the distribution of answers, right? Um, that actually elicited significantly higher quality work than just asking people to provide their answers and promising to pay them in response. Um, the other one was this punishment agreement condition. And what that basically said is it said, we're going to take away your bonus payment unless you agree with the other answers that other workers give, right? So a little weird, a little counterintuitive, but those were the two that when, you, when we did our statistical analysis of this, those are the two that were different from the control condition. Um, so the key here to these two is that they tie the payoffs, they tie the, the benefits that the workers get to their ability to think prospectively about what their, what their peers are doing, what their colleagues are doing. And this is where it got us, that got the two of us thinking about the fact that, you know, this sort of suggests that the more you think about the opinions of those around you, maybe the more likely you are to, to do higher quality work, which the fact that that happened in an environment like Amazon Mechanical Turk, where it's basically impossible for workers to interact with each other, and where there's so little, you know, sort of social uh, engagement going on in between individuals who are participating, let us to think, wow, it seems like these sorts of social, you know, social incentives, peer-based incentives, you know, maybe they really can be effective, and maybe there's something to this kind of intuition that, you know, getting awards makes you do things more effectively than not getting awards. So with that, time to pass to study them, pass to makeup. Cool. Uh, so hi, everyone. You'll be hearing a lot from me today because I'm also in doing the next session. But uh, um, as a little preview, I want to talk about an, an, um, basically an, an experiment that, uh, that, that was done myself with uh, a group of people at the MIT Media Lab uh, who work on a platform called Scratch, which I'll talk to you a little bit about, which was specifically designed to to use one of these sort of uh, to use one of these sort of social incentives as a way of encouraging more cooperation and uh, um, in an online community. So uh, the the Scratch is built around a programming language, and if you haven't seen it before or checked it out, I totally recommend looking at it. It's super cool. Um, it's a programming language that was. Uh, I mean, it's designed so that kids can use it, which is not to say that you need to be a kid to use it. Um, uh, uh, you can get a lot out of it. The basic idea is that you take these, uh, um, I won't try to unplug it, but the basic idea is that you try to take those blocks on the left corner, and you can, uh, you can see one of them says, like, move 10 steps forward, and one of them says, turn 15 degrees, and you can sort of drag them together in the middle area so that you can make programs which then control what are called sprites, basically little sort of object, graphical objects that exist over in that, um, in the, the top uh, right hand corner. It's uh, totally free software. Uh, it's releasing with GPL. You can check it out. And it's really cool. It allows, um, you can write programs without, you can't make a syntax error, right? The blocks just, they might not fit together. And it's certainly possible to create a program that doesn't do what you want, but you can't make a program that doesn't work. Um, uh, but Scratch, but, but, but the other cool thing, and where this really comes, where, where, where this sort of social incentives come is that Scratch is also an online community. Um, it was launched in 2007. Um, uh, uh, the, the community was so that back here, I guess you can't see it, but somewhere in that fi in that there's a share menu, right? So from within the application, you can choose to share your projects. Um, the the it was launched in 2007. There's more than a million users. About 13 years old is the average user, um, and they shared somewhere around it's close to three million projects by this point. Um, it keeps going up, right? Because people keep using it. Um, but uh, uh, but the important thing here is that Scratch is designed and built around collaboration and Remix. Every project in the Scratch online community is released under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license, the same license as Wikipedia. Um, the the and and I mean Scratch is a reference to like like. DJ's scratching, not that, that uh, that's directly involved in remixing, but uh, uh, it's trying to be evocative of remixing. Um, and all projects are sort of remixable. Um, so let's see. So, so in order to encourage more remix, the problem, of course, is that most, most projects in Scratch aren't remixed. Only about 10% of projects are ever remixed. So, there's, so it's a rich platform for collaboration, but 
most of the time collaboration doesn't happen or not very much. So to, to encourage more collaboration, what the Scratch administrators did was create sort of a social incentive um, on the front page. Basically what they did was they made a list on the front page, which was a list of, uh, was called What the Community is Remixing, which was a, um, a list of some recently remixed, and in particular sort of frequently remixed projects as a way of sort of highlighting those within the community. And this, the reason this is a social incentive is because being listed on the front page is like a very big deal in Scratch. Um, here's a quote from a Scratch user whose project was, was uh, featured on the front page saying, this is so great, plus the love it button, I'm so happy this is the greatest day of my life. You know? um, like 13 year olds, short lives, but uh, um, we, can, we, can, we, we can do something. It's a very cool community. Um, um, uh, um, but, um, uh, and this is what remixing looked like beforehand. This is what it was trying to encourage. So on the, on the right hand side you see a Starship game uh, called Neo. You can search for this on the Scratch website, it's super cool. It's like a, it's like a, like a kind of like, I don't know, Arrow Fighters, one of these sort of side-scrolling uh, plane games drawn in chalk and it shoots, or in crayon, and it shoots little, I don't know, like lasers or space, space weapons at opposing spaceships, right? Um, uh, and then this is a remix of that same project. You can see down in the bottom corner, maybe you can't see it, but it says based on Curie's project. So you can see, so it's sort of, the system keeps track of which projects are being remixed. Um, and this is a remix called Star Wars Republican Gunship, which is basically the same game, except instead of controlling Kran like spaceships, you control Star Wars spaceships mixed with sort of Republican political figures uh, who uh, shoot at other Star Wars spaceships or TIE fighters which have like, you know, John McCain, uh, uh, Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, uh, sort of similar ones. And it's pretty funny, the kid who posted it was like, don't worry, it's, I, I'm actually a Democrat, like this, you know, 10 year old, like, 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 like uh, so it's like, it's okay that I do this. Um, in any case, um, uh, 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 after, the, the, after the incentive though, what they, what, what they saw was that, so, so basically it worked, and I don't have the graph up here to show you this, but basically the, the chance of a project being remixed um, before, before the intervention was actually twice the chance of a project being remixed afterwards, right? So after they introduced this thing, they got lots more remixing. But what they got was a big change in the nature of remixing, right? So here's an example of the kind of project that started showing up a lot um, in the period right after, uh, uh, after this incentive, right? This is add yourself as a pizza topping, right? And, uh, uh, and you can see there's some sort of implausible pizza toppings, ice cream cones, like rotating um, recycling symbols, things like this. <laughs> Having a conversation on the context of the pizza. Um, uh, and there's lots of kids who have remixed this. It's become like sort of a, a, a chain remix. And, and they saw tons and tons of this stuff, right? That, um, um, and so, but, and so, and so, the question is, is that you, you see this, you see this big change in the nature of what's being produced, right? But through the introduction of the incentive. So the question is, um, maybe, I mean, maybe this is even sort of bad. So what we did is we actually compared a bunch of projects um, in the period before and after this intervention, right? The introduction of this new incentive to estimate the sort of the, the change in complexity, because as you can see, this project is a much simpler form of sort of a cheaper, easier form of remixing than this one, right? Um, so we didn't, we compare that and we looked by number of uh, uh, sort of source lines of code, the amount of control blocks, each of those is kind of a block there. It's kind of like comparing the lines of code in a program. Um, uh, and, 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 um, and, and we also looked for, uh, made this comparison between new users and existing users, because it's actually kind of an important um, uh, distinction. The idea is, is that this incentive could work in two ways. Either we could be attracting new users because those new users might be um, uh, uh, who were like basically pe people who were previously unincentivized, uh, like unincented to participate or to remix, and that's good, right? It just means we have we have all these big old we have these big uh, complex forms of remixing going on, but we also have this uh, these these new simpler ways which are made possible. But the other option is, is that this is actually changing the nature of remix in the sense that those people who used to be doing complex code based projects are now just doing simple projects because they want to get remixed and they're going to do whatever is cheapest and easiest. So you can see where this is going to go. Um, uh, basically what we found was that, uh, that, that uh, this is the graph of sort of account, P the, the red line is users who were around um, before the intervention and what happened to them afterwards. And then the blue line, it's not really a line, the blue point is users who joined afterwards. What you see is that um, the introduction of this incentive actually caused, and because of the nature of this thing, we have pretty good causal uh, data on this, the nature of this analysis. Um, actually, it actually caused the average complexity of projects to decrease. In fact, um, w without increasing the number of projects, like like there were actually less code being uploaded to Scratch in the three weeks after the intervention than there was in the period before. Um, and it worked in two ways. It both encouraged, it did encourage these new users who maybe weren't as skilled at creating projects to come in and build these projects like 
add yourself as a pizza topping or something like that, these very simple um, projects. But it also changed, in that red line, it also changed the, the um, it also resulted in, in a decrease in the amount of work being done by the people who were there before. Right? Like there was actually less work being done by the people who were around before because they were just trying to get the award. Um, uh, when, you, when you create the incentive, you get exactly what you're paying for, but very often you'll change the nature of what's being produced by introducing that incentive. So uh, uh, that sort of raises this question that, 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 that maybe these awards are a little are more complicated than, than we think and can lead to some bad stuff. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. yeah. What, was the, what was kind of the criteria of whether something got featured? So it was a little, it, yeah, it, it was automated, it was a little opaque to users. It was never described clearly. Okay. Um, so, so there was no hand-picked process saying, wow, this is really good. That's right. There was, so there, there, well, there was also a hand-picked process which existed before. This was in addition to the hand-picked process. Okay. There, th th so, so there are multiple ways of getting on the front page. Mo all of those existed before, so we're sort of controlling for those because those exist before and afterwards. N no, no ways of getting on the front page were taken away. Okay. It was just in addition to what was there before. I see. All right. So that brings us to barn stars. Um, so you might have seen uh, a recent paper um, by some folks up at uh, Stony Brook um, on barn stars, which, you know, the, when we were starting to think about how to study barn stars, we kept thinking to ourselves, God, it'd be really great if, you know, if we had just done an experiment or if somebody would just do an experiment and see if barn stars worked, because that would be a perfect place to test this idea of whether awards actually produce effects or not. And uh, lo and behold, a few months ago, it turned out that uh, some colleagues in the sociology department up there had done such a study where they had uh, randomly distributed some barn stars um, on the English language Wikipedia, and they found that barn stars had a positive effect on people's contributions in subsequent weeks. So what we were thinking when we started this study was that we were going to be testing this theory, trying to test this theory, not so much by doing a randomized field study, because there are weird things when you do a randomized study where you know they had to make decisions about how to select people who got the awards and things like that. Um, and we wanted to see if we could find a way to measure whether this was happening in the wild, so to speak, right? Like if, if barn stars that were already out there in the world had produced this kind of effect and if we could go track that down. So the place we started our analysis was with this insight that sometimes awards work as sort of status symbols and sometimes they don't. And this comes out of, uh, that's Maimonides up there, by the way, if you haven't met Maimonides. He was, he was around about five or 6,000 years ago, I think. Um, sorry. Oh, somebody chuckled. Anyway, uh, anyway the, the, the point is um, he has this sort of ladder of voluntary activity, charitable activity. And in his ladder of more sort of morally beneficial voluntary activity, the best kind of voluntary activity you can do is the kind where you expect no recognition whatsoever for your actions. So at least even though we have this sort of standards in our society where if you donate money to George Washington University, you get your name on the door, or you get your name on the building or something like that, right? We're used to this kind of thing where we attribute names to people who do good charitable acts and good volunteer work. Um, that might not be everybody's, everybody's cup of tea, right? There might be a few Maimonides out there in the world who are willing to do this stuff and really value it more if they don't have their name in lights after the fact. So, that was where we started, and w so what we wanted to think about was whether these kinds of awards that we're interested in, like barn stars, um, like forms of public recognition on Scratch, would produce the same effects across these two populations. Um, and the reason we wanted to think about it that way was that we figured out that barn stars and Wikipedia gave us a great chance to think about that distinction and measure that distinction in a nice, clear way. Um, I'm going to skip over that. Um, and uh, the reason we wanted to look at this and the way that we're going to operationalize this is that in Wikipedia, as I'm sure most of you know, the idea is that barn stars are given on user talk pages, right? Um, this is one that was given to Jimbo by the great llama um, for a number of things, including uh, creating Wikipedia. Um, so Jimbo puts his on his user page. Many people do this. It's, it's a way, you know, I think... We, we describe this sort of lightly in the slide as showing them off, but it's also just a way of you know, publicly displaying your accomplishments, right? It's not, it can be like a trophy case, or it can be framed in other ways. But the point is that not everybody does that. Um, so our case in point here is actually Magnus Manska, who has dozens of barn stars um, and created MediaWiki software and uh, has displayed none of them on his user page. And so lucky for us, it turns out that almost exactly half of the users in our sample at the time that we originally collected this data 
um, had not displayed their barn stars on their user page. So really it's this, it's this question then of whether people who move their barn stars and who in that way, whether they mean it this way exactly or not, they do it in a way that publicly signals that they receive this award, have the same kind of result from getting the award as the people who don't. Right, so it's the Jimbos and the Magnuses, and uh, you know you can sort of figure out where you might find yourself on the spectrum too. It's kind of fun that way. Um, and I'm going to skip a lot of the setup, but what we found here is uh, the blue line is, are the results, and these are edits per week, and these are weeks that are centered around the week when the, these users got their first barn star. So that middle point in the graph is the week when the first barn star gets given. And the blue line, or the turquoise line, are people who move the stars, and the red dash, red line, are the people who don't move the stars, right? Um, so signalers are blue, non-signalers are the red. And we find this really interesting finding where, first of all, I mean, it might just be a product of our controls, but we see this difference that's persistent throughout the entire period for how many edits per week on average these individuals are making. And then more importantly, we see this little discontinuity around the week of that barn star where for the signalers, you can see there's a very tiny gap, and actually that gap is not statistically significant, so that could just be an artifact of some other noise in our data. Um, but for the non-signalers, we see this little drop, and that little drop is statistically significant, suggesting that the barn star actually, you know, I'm hesitant to say causes in a strong way, but it, it comes really at the exact same time as they drop off in edits. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, on top of all of that, you can see, it's, I mean, every, every barn star seems to be given at this, kind, at this kind of inflection point in people's editing trajectory, where oftentimes they come after you've completed a project or something like that, so it's this kind of local maximum, right? Um, and everybody drops back towards, regresses towards some sort of normal editing rate afterwards. So it's this really amazing pattern where, where we see, you know, not at all what we expected. Um, you know, or not of any of the reasons that you thought you were giving the award or what you thought you were trying to encourage with this award. So we're still analyzing this data and refining this analysis. Um, but this is the clearest version of what we've found so far. Um, so this is just recapturing what I said. Um, and that gives you a sense of the effect size. So for th that's, for th that's the decrease for the non-signalers, right? Four to five edits per week, about three to four percent of their editing total. And these are all barn star recipients, keep in mind, who on average are huge contributors, right? Making thousands of edits. Their accounts are on average over a year old when they get their first barn star. So these are not, you know, these are people who are really making a lot of contributions to the encyclopedia. Um, so what do we make of all this? Um, so think back, all three studies that we presented, right? You get this sort of mix of results, right? Where in the first one we find that, a, that social incentives seem to work for crowdsourcing workers. Then we find that in the case of Scratch, if we, don't, if we don't design them right, they seem to actually enhance the, an activity that we don't really want, a, a kind of collaboration that we're not excited about. And then in the case of barn stars, we see that in certain contexts, they can even seem to result in people decreasing their contributions to a collaborative project. So what we take away from all this is basically that, it's not that we need to throw out social awards and incentives. In fact, I mean, the, the, the Scratch example and the crowdsourcing example, the MTurk example, are great cases where they seem to support collaborative work in certain ways. Um, the important thing here is that crowding out, this dynamic where if you give me an award, I'm actually maybe less motivated to contribute afterwards. Um, and poor incentive designs, like incentive designs that encourage the kind of behavior we're not so interested in, like in the case of Scratch, can be real dangers, um, especially when you introduce this kind of extrinsic mechanism for trying to get people to do some kind of behavior, right? Um, and that these differences in individuals' motivations um, and the norms within a community can really produce powerful differences in how people behave. So that's where we wrap up. Uh, thanks so much for paying attention. We can both stand up and take questions while Nico switches out the laptops. Um, sure, yeah. I got two questions for you. Uh, you described that, uh, that curve as the local maximum. Did you look at longer term stuff and, and see that, in fact, it was a, a little peak on some larger curve? Or so at a descriptive stuff? level, at a descriptive level, yeah. Like um, basically everybody's edit history, when we aggregate all the edit histories, they tend to sort of be very uh, peaky. You know, they kind of go like this. And at some point, they reach some lifetime maximum, but then they sort of peak their way down. Um, and of course, many users in our data set are still active editors. Uh, some are not, but in general, yes, it follows that pattern. We, we are planning to look at whether or not the, uh, there's a difference over the lifetime of editor contributions, right? That's one of the analyses we haven't completed yet. 
Um, so whether you know this signal or non-signal difference is persistent across you know the entirety of someone's edit history. Uh, we haven't done that quite yet, though. so that's yeah. Second question. Second question. Uh, these are the, the uh, rewards you describe, um, not so much in the uh, mechanical search one, but yeah. the other two are really big deal awards. You know, featured on the home page. Featured. A bar is a really big deal. Yeah. Uh, do you look at any of the, like the Foursquare style? Here's a little thing. You visited five new restaurants. Like oh, badges. badges. We yeah. did not look at that. There's a really interesting paper though. Uh, Octay, O K T A Y, and some collaborators did looking at. Um, Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow. Yeah, there's tons of work, and the short version with the stat, the short, the short version with that stuff is that. So, 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 I mean, we don't really have enough time to go into this in in a lot of depth, but but there are lots of different kinds of awards. There are awards which are like competitions, where it's like Salesman of the Year or something like that, right? There are awards which are achievements, which are like 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 kind of Foursquare stuff or like um, or like Stack Overflow badges, right? Like you know that when you you, you know you, you'll get or like uh, Yelp, like Epic, whatever Yelp Epic status, some kind of like elite status, right? Like, and, and what you see with these kinds of ones, um, with these kinds of awards, so when you, with competitions, what you see is a lot of um, you see that very often people decide that they're not competing and they just don't try at all, or not getting an award can be a huge disincentive to people um, in the long term. These badges, what you see every time is yeah, yeah. like people work really hard right, right up to the point where they get it and then fall off. <laughs> right? Like um, uh, you, everyone wants to get elite status, but once they get get, get elite status, like you see a big uh, a big sort of decrease in activity. And then there are then there are things like like um, like I think like the types of things we've shown here, which are more like uh, uh, more social awards, where it's hard to tell whether you're going to get them. They're not limited in the amount that you can get. They're in some ways sort of seem like they should be the best of uh, like the the one of the better ways of imagining this. And there are still some limitations and issues with it. Oh. Hello. Hi. Um, good work, guys. Uh, ben Schneider from University of Maryland. Uh, great to see you pursuing these things. I wonder if you comment on two aspects of this. You, there's something called the Sports Illustrated effect, which is when an athlete winds up on the cover of Sports Illustrated, it seems to be invariably their performance drops. The theses are that actually they just randomly perform better uh, and they drop down. But here you've got actual performance. And so uh, the cause of the drop is really the interesting one. Do they just need to sort of relax a little and celebrate, take a victory lap? That's easy. Uh, or, you know, the other conjecture is that the, the system is that barn stars is as good as you can get. I mean, maybe Wikipedia needs to add even higher goals beyond that of double barn stars or you know some sort of magical diamond bind, you know, <laughs> diamond star that you know that that leave them a further aspiration. Could you comment on either of these, the sort of drop off or the further aspiration? So idea? I mean, like, like I mean, so the answer, the, answer, the real answer is we don't know. We, we've had this conversation. Yeah, with, right, so I mean, my, my, my sense is that is that it's is that it's. Uh, it's, it's, it's even more than the Sports Illustrated effect. It's that like I just spent a huge amount of time working on things. And I can tell you, I got my first barn star after I had made I don't know 600 edits in one day, and it wasn't even related to the editing. It was I got a barn star from my user page. So the reason someone saw my user page is that I just edited 600 pages in the last two hours, right? So it was just about exposure, like 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 um yeah. in that case, right? And did I make less edits in the next week? Yeah, because I just made 600 edits and like uh, like I, got, I was like you know like. So, 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 so part of the answer might be like a little, a, a, some aspect of burnout in here, and because you see this strong sort of cyclical nature to things, m m that's that's my intuition, right? Yeah. That's not something that we can, that's not something that we can uh, address with. Um, with uh, uh, based on the nature of this design, what we have seen in the experimental work is that is that barn stars. If you give someone a barn star, they add a little bit more, and they're actually more likely to get subsequent barn stars, right? Um, uh, like like. Uh, but this is ran this is this is when they're randomly given out. Now the problem is if you actually randomly give out awards, like in a systematic way, then they'll be worth less. Because um, and in fact, there were people who were upset when they found out about this experiment um, because. Uh, uh, you know, this like, it, the idea that, that that award that they got wasn't real, that someone didn't really value that um, that work, is something that can actually be a huge turnoff in the long term as well. So, yeah. Great work, guys. This is as important as the Higgs boson. <laughs> <laughs> let's, um, let's, let's okay, yeah. So, so yeah. Um, uh, okay, very quick. This reminds me of some studies they've done with ethics, where people are given choices of making two different ethical choices, and when they, when the, when they make the, the ethical choice with the first one, there's a much greater chance that they make a less ethical choice with the second one, because they feel like they've earned the chance to right. let themselves go a little bit. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of complicated, I mean, this is the, studying people, it's like, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, when I, when I, when I, like, die, I get to go to heaven and become, like, a, like, a physicist or something. So, um, quickly, uh, before you start, for those of you who are standing in the back, there are, uh, like, a cluster of seats up towards here, so if you want, feel free. 
Cool. All right. So, uh, uh, all right. So, welcome everyone. I'll try to. Um, uh, th this is sort of my my uh, for my sins. This is an impossible task I set myself every year, um, uh, uh, which is to uh, which is to summarize the year last year of uh, work and research in Wikipedia. Um, uh, so, so actually, there's a funny story behind this. I actually set out to do this in like 2007 or 2008. Um, I, I, I swear this is my last year. I think I probably said that last year, but I, I mean it this year. Um, uh, 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 the idea was that I, I basically wrote this little description which says, I'm going to write a literature, literature review of all of the academic work that's been published on Wikipedia this year. This is in 2007, 2008. So it's into, before Wikimania in 2008. And it says, great, you know, I'll describe all the academic landscape as it's shaping up on the project. I was considering doing work in Wikipedia. I thought it would be good to do this. I said, well, I probably can't read all of the papers, so I'll just read all the ones published in the last year. So of course, two weeks before the conference, because I'm kind of lazy, like, uh, uh, I basically go to like search for like, OK, show me all the pages on Google Scholar published in the last year. And what I see is some sign like 800 results or something. And I was like, oh boy, I have a busy week, right? Um, and, and, and I sort of do the math. And I'm like, OK, I have a 45 minute talk. This year, I have a 25 minute talk. Um, I worked it out that I had 3.45 seconds per paper um, to talk about it, right? Um, and believe it or not, this year is actually even bigger, right? This is the sort of, uh, this is the graph of sort of number of pub papers with just with the term Wikipedia in the title. There are lots more papers without the term Wikipedia in the title, um, which are published every year. Um, uh, uh, and actually, this year we're on, we're on schedule to break our previous record. So uh, um, it's like big and bigger. There's tons and tons of work on uh, Wikipedia for in lots and lots of different areas. What that means is that it's completely impossible for me to do this talk in any kind of responsible and comprehensive way. So I put up, uh, like in Wikipedia, every time you do something responsible, irresponsible, uh, you just put a little disclaimer on the top, which means that like, now you like, have full like, freedom to do whatever you like. So uh, you can present something which is like super biased and uh, comprehensive, because you like, said you're going to do it. So that's, um, uh, uh, that's my plan today. Um, in the next like whatever 15 minutes or so, um, uh, uh, what I've, I will tell so, so I, and there is a method to this particular madness, um, which is that I've uh, I've gone through the list of uh, basically a list of papers that I could sort of find that were published in the last year, and I've tried to select ones that that uh, were trying to fulfill a set of criteria with the goal of sort of giving Wikipedians in particular. So I mean, there's, I'm sure there's plenty of researchers actually. Uh, uh, who's sitting in, the, sitting in this room, and if I'm talking about your papers, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I got the term from you, the research karaoke, that's the, uh, the, the sort of plan. So, so, so what I want to do is select a set of papers that um, uh, are representative of the kind of work that's being done in Wikipedia this year. What I want to do is try to represent themes for Wikipedia research in the last year. And by, and by that, I mean things that are like new types of work, maybe stuff that wasn't done historically, but there are, there are five or six papers about them this year, sort of like, Trending, and then that's like the term for like derivatives, right? Like positives, like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, but like I, things that are sort of getting bigger. Also, idea that of uh, research topics or areas of research which are of potential interest to Wikipedians. Um, and also, I tried to do stuff with people that I didn't realize were going to be here. Now, it just might be because I'm irresponsible. If I'm talking about your work, if you see your name up on a slide, just like raise your hand, and then I'll let you can come up here and talk about it for like two minutes. Um, uh, 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 but 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 the idea here is to sort of give people a sort of idea of what's going on here, because my frustration has been that historically, and part of the reason I don't feel the need to do this talk next year is I think that 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 um, we our community has become much better at this, but historically there's been this big gap between the academic research which has gone on about Wikipedia and like the work that's going on in Wikipedia, right? There have been all these people who build tools, and I'm not going to talk about one of these papers this year, but in the past there are people who like build like, we built this great way of like identifying vandalism, right? Like someone will do like a, like a PhD dissertation on like identifying vandalism in Wikipedia, and you'll go and you'll talk to Wikipedians and nobody's heard about it, right? This person hasn't contacted anyone, and it's not, it's not the researcher's fault, well I mean, Sort of the research fault, um, uh, 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 but it's but it's the, it's it, it's it's the fact that like our communities historically haven't had a lot of great ways of communicating effectively between research research communities and um, and uh, and sort of the and the Wikipedia project. That's actually gotten a lot better. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the uh, some of the work that people have been doing within the Wikimedia community as part of the research committee and as part of a few other things to sort of a few other projects to really sort of make research more accessible and visible to researchers and, and, and hopefully that's useful. So.
In any case, uh, with that uh, too long introduction aside, uh, I want to talk about a set of cool papers that have been published in the last year, which I think are representative of cool trends in the research or sort of interesting ideas. One thing that I've seen a lot more of in the last year, um, or the last year or so, is a bunch of work which is sort of looking at whether Wikipedia is achieving its goals in certain ways. And you didn't see this work as much early on, other than like, how big is Wikipedia, that kind of stuff. And I think part of the reason was is that like, researchers didn't know what Wikipedia's goals were, and like, um, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't as familiar. Um, this is a paper by uh, Shane Greenstein and Feng Zhu. Um, I actually talked about it in a previous year. I talked about another paper by um, Feng Zhu, which, was, which was, I thought was also excellent, um, which, is a which is a paper publishing was probably the best or one of the two or three best economics journals um, uh, out there. Um, and what it's doing is it's looking at, uh, it, it's, the question it's asking is in the title. They, it's nice when you put the, the, I like it when they put the, like, the question in the title, like, is Wikipedia biased? And then the answer is like, yes. They should, that's what they, they should, if they just, then they could like tweet the whole paper, right? Okay. Uh, uh, but, but, but I'm gonna continue talking about the paper for a few minutes, even though I've given you the answer. Um, the, 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 what they did was they looked at a bunch of articles about US politics, like something like 70,000 articles, and then they took a subsample of, um, like a third of them. And what they did was they, they, they used this method in political science to identify bias in text. And these were all articles about US politics. And the method basically works by taking uh, this, this big subset of, um, uh, th th of like all of the sort of congressional like, speeches which are being made by the Republicans and the Democrats, and they identify by the terms which are basically like only used by Republicans and only used by Democrats, right? Is these like sort of these coded ways of like set, of, of like sort of referring to a particular position. And then what they did was they took all of the articles in Wikipedia about U.S. political topics. And they looked for the presence of these particular words, and they said, okay, are there like m lots of these words or more of one type of word from another? And they can say this article is like kind of democratically biased, that bias towards Democrats is sort of bias towards Republicans. And what they found was, um, and what they uh, what they found was that 40% of the articles and the sort of the politics topics that they addressed were biased. Um, uh, and they found out that over time, Wikipedia started out basically biased more towards Democrats, but has sort of become uh, more evenly split. But it's become evenly split not in the sense that the articles have become less biased. They've become easily evenly split in the sense that people are uploading lots of like Republican biased articles. Um, or at least a larger proportion of the new articles have, have, have been done that way. Um, so, 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 so they say, and, and the actual nature of the bias hasn't um, been reduced. In some follow-up work that's coming out reasonably soon, they've actually um, suggested that increased collaboration in editing does not actually reduce this, that more work on the article doesn't seem to reduce the amount of bias. So it's kind of interesting. And it's also potentially a way, um, and like where this comes back to the communities, I'm, I'm thinking like, wow, that's a great way we can like look for like automated systems of bias, or something like that, right? Which is not something that, I mean, I, these guys are both great, but I don't think that that's a conversation that's been being have, had. All right, next. Um, tons of talk about the gender gap, some of which has already been at this conference so far. Lots more of which you'll hear much more of. Um, and there's been tons of gender gap research in the last year. I mean, this is something that historically there was not very much of at all. And in the last year, it's just been sort of, it's just sort of exploded. Uh, the conference Wikisim, which is super great. Uh, it's a conference for like research about wikis and also um, free culture projects and also Wikipedia in particular. Both of the like award-winning papers this year were about like um, gender in Wikipedia in one form or another. Um, one paper which uh, I want to sort of cite here is this paper by um, Judd Anton and the group of other people who are all great, but whose names I won't mention right now, um, uh, which uh, tried to look at what I sort of see as sort of the second stage of this sort of gender gap research, which is not just saying, okay, there is one, or like, how does it come about, but actually saying, okay, what are the effects of it, right, in terms of the nature of work. And what they did was they studied, th they, they took um, uh, like 250,000 users who created accounts in English Wikipedia between September 2010 and um, uh, February 2011, and they looked at their sort of subsequent editing behavior, and then they sort of coded qualitatively all of the edits that those people had made sort of um, uh, by the nature of the work. And I won't go into the full details, but you can check out the paper. I mean, for all these, you can check out the paper. I, I encourage you to do so. Um, what they found was that in the lower three quartiles, that is like the 75% the of the least active editors, um, they behaved in, uh, Men and women behave very similarly, but in the top quartile, they actually saw very different types of work. In particular, the top 25% of Wikipedians by activity levels were um, uh, uh, had a few of these sort of key differences. One was that 25% of the revision, only 25% of the revisions in this top group were made by women. 
Um, so the men were editing more. The women also tended to make larger editions, which is to say that they maybe edit, made less edits, but they made bigger edits. Um, they also made uh, significantly larger revisions in terms of things like adding new content and in terms of rephrasing existing, if, if rephrasing existing text. So you can see, yeah, you can begin to see some of the, the, the sort of the, the impact in terms of the nature of the different types of work that men and women are doing here, some of the impact of, of, of gender gap in terms of the way that it works in the community. And there's been some other really good work that's looked at, for example, the way uh, in which men and women um, uh, contribute to different, like, different types of articles, different types of topics, um, and the way that that leads to sort of um, uh, systematic under coverage of particular types of topics in Wikipedia. So uh, another cool area that I don't remember seeing uh, very much work on at all, but which I've seen sort of like six or seven papers, in part because the first author here, Brian Keegan, wrote like half of them um, uh, in, in the last year is a bunch of work, uh, he's a great guy as well, um, uh, is, 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 is a, a, a bunch of work on breaking news topics on Wikipedia, which is to say like not work in Wikinews, but like, like the, uh, I mean like, uh, maybe it should be in Wikinews, but, uh, uh, but a lot of this work that goes into covering, covering things like you know, like the like a major earthquake, or uh, you know, like these sorts of like breaking news and, and disasters. There's a huge amount, and you actually see that a huge amount of traffic to Wikipedia um, goes to these breaking news articles, and a huge amount of um, because people want to know about them, and a huge amount of contributions all, also um, come there as well. What he did was he looked at um, he, uh, in this paper, they looked at um, they basically took all these airline disasters, right? Like just like they like made a, a horrible like thing. They made a, they made a list of all these airline disasters, some of which happened like before Wikipedia, and some of which happened so they weren't caused by Wikipedia, and then the, uh, 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 and then all the and then all the, the the airline and then these like more recent airline disasters as well. And what they and what they um, and what they did was that they, they they could then uh, compare like you know similar very similar topics and the type of collaboration that happens on these in a, in a breaking news context and in a non-breaking news context. And they see very different types of behaviors. They see they they found that uh, uh, that breaking news articles were likely to attract uh, more editors, which makes sense. They also saw that they um, uh, were more likely to get experts to. Um, the, 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 the breaking news articles were less likely to get experts to sort of work together. They had a very sort of like network focus. They like people study social networks in here. So um, uh, uh, they saw that experienced editors worked together, uh, would, some, would sometimes work on these articles, but they would sort of work with each other. Um, uh, and uh, the, um, but, but they, uh, and they, they also found that the experienced editors were unlikely to, but they were unlikely to collaborate together in the context of the breaking news articles in general. Um, Experienced editors tended to contribute to similar types of articles more than dissimilar types of articles this is within the sort of I idea, suggesting the existence of classes of experienced editors who mostly focusing on breaking new to topics. That is, there are certain groups of people who worked on these. So there's all kinds of interesting work going on in breaking news. There's like six or seven papers. You can um, check these out. Um, I've linked to a lot of this stuff and a whole bunch of other work from uh, the page on the Wikimania site for this talk. So, um, and I'll be improving that. I'll post these notes and stuff. Great. Moving forward, um, uh, uh, this is like this is like this class of, of there's this class of Wikipedia articles which is sort of evaluating Wikipedia's quality. It's the like does Wikipedia work? And they, again, yes, right? Um, uh, but there's but, but like every year you see dozens of these articles which are like some group saying is Wikipedia high quality in these areas? I mean, I remember one from a few years ago that was like was it like rectal fistula? Like what is the quality of Wikipedia like in compared to other sort of sources? Like, it's really good. Um, um, uh, uh, but what this, but this is a very comprehensive one. It's actually one of the better ones in this uh, idea, but I'm sort of throwing it out there because it is such a large portion of the research that goes on about Wikipedia. Um, which it, th this was um, a, a group of uh, psychologists basically compared um, Wikipedia articles in 10 mental, mental health topics, which included suicide, depression, schizophrenia. It's like a real, Real, yeah, heartwarming uh, topics. Um, uh, many of the happiest parts of Wikipedia, and uh, and then they compared it to 13 other websites. It was like very comprehensive. Um, the most recent edition of the Comprehensive Textbook of Psychiatry and to Encyclopedia like, Britannica. Um, and they did this by basically getting three psychologists who had lots of expertise in these particular areas to um, read these, and they rated them on accuracy, up to dateness, breadth of coverage, uh, quality of references, and uh, readability. And what they found was the quality of information on depression and schizophrenia on Wikipedia is generally as good as or better than that provided by centrally controlled websites, Britannica, and the psychiatry textbook. Um, but the reason I wanted to point this out, other than the fact that it's just a big deal, is that like there are like at least a couple dozen groups of people who are going out there and systematically evaluating Wikipedia content every year. The vast majority of whom never like no one ever finds out about them, or if they do, they don't like actually take those criticisms. Like you could read these articles or at least email the authors and get their data set, and you could just fix every one of those shortcomings 
in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in these articles. And that's something that, like, I don't know, my goal for the next year is next time I see these papers, that's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, or I'm going to send it to you. You can tell me and I'll send it to you. you can. Uh, uh, um, um, right. Um, so, there's a, so, so there's another one of these big classes of articles that like every year I do this, I talk about, is this idea of Wikipedia as a data source. These are people, and, and what's interesting is that historically it was like people who were like, I study networks. Where can I find network data? And it's like, oh my god, Wikipedia has so many networks, right? Um, or people who are like, I study, you know, like unstructured text. Oh my god, this is so great. Um, and so, and so, a lot of this stuff is just uh, very much sort of people using it as like this really awesome data source, which is great. That like, you know, we've been able to create this thing, which is sort of accessible and useful for so many people. Um, this one I thought was really interesting. This is um, um, because I think that this is sort of like the next, the next, the next level, and very interesting. Because in the past, this has mostly been like download dumps, use the API you know, find some new findings, declare victory, right? And the concerns are controlling uh, stuff, uh, 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 sorry, um, uh, uh, the interesting thing with this paper, which is about sort of DNA and nucleic sciences, is that, is that, is that, is that what they're talking about is actually, the, uh, they've been putting their data into Wikipedia, they've been doing annotation on some nucleic data by actually just editing the articles, adding stuff to the info boxes, and then sort of using it as their central store for their data source. So the idea is like, we could create our own, we could create our own wiki and like, they have, but like, wouldn't it be great if we did this in a way that made it accessible to other people, and if it's structured enough, we can actually use it as a data source for our own work, right? And for me, this is like such an exciting idea of the idea of um, uh, um, of the idea of actually having the, the the database be Wikipedia, so that it's both accessible to, to to everyone, but also sort of useful for this kind of for this kind of work. Um, and and uh, they've got concerns though, right? They're concerned about control. They're concerned about how to teach scientists how to use and contribute to Wikipedia. They can just buy your book. Uh, um, we'll give everyone a copy of how, how Wikipedia works. Uh, and then they're and they're and they're they're worried about ensuring credit for contributions because it's like very hard to find out who like added something, a particular thing to Wikipedia, despite the hard work of people who may be in this room. Um, uh, um, there are lots of interesting issues here, but I think it's an interesting place to build, and I think it's an interesting way in which this type of work has sort of evolved. All right. Uh, Maybe my personal favorite uh, uh, sort of way in which I think that the, I've seen like direction that I see the literature taking is a lot of work on readership. Like historically, there's always been like a couple papers here and then on, on, on readers of Wikipedia. But historically, when people have studied Wikipedia, they've studied people who edit it, which makes sense. I mean, that's what's in the database dump. That's what the API can give you. Um, there's always been some aggregate data on viewership information, which has been accessible to, to, to people at least since 2007. There's been some of this data, but, there, uh, but otherwise, finding out data about, about users means you have to go find the users, right? And I don't know, academics are lazy, like you do. Uh, uh, so, so often they don't do that. But there's been a bunch of work that's gone on in the last year that has actually gone out and tried to survey people and get an understanding of how people, how people use Wikipedia, how readers, non-contributors are sort of using it. Um, it's interesting, the Wikimedia Foundation did a survey of editors in 2008 and has not done one since. We don't actually, uh, uh, information on readership is actually much less good, yeah. Okay, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, um, so there you get, great study here on Wikipedia and education, a case study. This was done at Liverpool Hope University. It was an opt-in survey. They got 133 sort of staff academics and about 1,200 students to answer their survey. Um, uh, what they found was that 75% of the students respondents said they used Wikipedia for some purpose, and they had a whole bunch of detail on how that worked. Um, my favorite finding from the study was that they found that the staff also used it, about 75%, um, uh, for some purpose, but 60% of the same staff expressly told their students not to use Wikipedia for any purpose, right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, it's really this idea of sort of like, do what I say, not what I do, right? Um, um, and, 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 and I think that this is a really sort of, um, the, 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 fine, the, the, the place where this starts is like, listen, we can keep telling people not to use Wikipedia when everyone, including the people saying it, are doing it. Or we can think about um, creating guidelines or ways to describe how to use Wikipedia, right? And this is and this is something which, because through through sort of an understanding of the increased use of Wikipedia, we can sort of um, uh, we can we can we can grow from this. We can, we can help build understandings of how to use Wikipedia content in education, for example, and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, uh, the final point, uh, uh, sort of research uh, stream, is not really a paper per se, although there are papers which is uh, the wiki research research, or some of my attempt to summarize the efforts to summarize the efforts uh, uh, people studying Wikipedia, um, uh, uh, which is that this year, more than any previous year, I mean, like by far, has seen a whole bunch of efforts to do basically the like correct, responsible version of what I'm doing here right now, um, uh, which, is, which is to say that, that there have been a, uh, uh, that there, there was a great session with this evening, Baltus and some other people maybe in the room, who, uh, uh, to, to have a session on uh, at WikiSim last year about uh, uh, trying to write like a, a good, uh, like like build a great um, 
sort of summary of work on, on Wikipedia. There's been this Wikipapers repository uh, work, which uh, a number of people have been working on. It's been really fantastic, actually. A huge uh, 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 wiki full of lots of summaries of uh, academic work on Wikipedia and on wikis more generally. A bunch of this work has landed in ACAWiki, the wiki for summaries of academic articles, which afterwards I will be encourage all of you, all of you to contribute to as well. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps most importantly, there's been a huge amount of work on this Wikimedia research newsletter, which is like basically like twice as much as I've told you every month, uh, um, you know, available at no cost on uh, meta.wikimedia.org, um, and it's really, really awesome. Um, uh, it's the kind of thing that, 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 that for the first time in this last year, I've really felt like I've like had some idea about like what's going on in my community. Um, of people studying this stuff. Um, it's really fantastic. Um, it's something that I have not been as involved with as uh, I would like, but something which I uh, encourage you to do as I say, not as I do, um, uh, and to become involved with as well. Um, and uh, I think that, that there's lots of efforts to, to, to do, uh, sort of, to follow what's going on and to do actually, there's some good efforts to build real research about Wikipedia research. And with that, uh, I am going to be done for the year. Uh, uh, <laughs> see, uh, <laughs> All right, before I get going to my actual content, I just want to give a brief introduction of myself and WikiHow. I'm Jack Herrick, I'm the founder of WikiHow. For those who don't know, WikiHow is the Wiki How To Manual. Our mission is to build the world's greatest how-to manual. We uh, are very popular with readers. We're a top 100 website, according to Quantcast. We are known for our friendly editing community among, among Wiki communities. We are very small compared to Wikipedia in the editing community. We're 1 30th the size of Wikipedia, of the English Wikipedia. Uh, makes us a big wiki relative to other wikis, but still small. There's uh, 15, 15 of us here at Wikimania, and hope you have a chance to meet some. There's a whole bunch sitting right over there. And with that, I'm going to hop right into the talk. So I'd like you to imagine two different worlds. World one, I'm going to call a world where these people that I'm going to refer to as knowledge philanthropists go and build knowledge, build their own skills, and then share that knowledge with the world. In the process, make everyone just a little bit smarter. World two, people I'm going to call brain numbers, spend time making themselves actively more stupid, and recruit their friends into the same process. <laughs> Unfortunately, these worlds actually exist. <laughs> these knowledge philanthropists are in this room. They are wiki editors. They build their own, they build skills. They learn about topics and then write about them and share it with other people. In the process, they make themselves smarter. They learn how to edit. They learn how to collaborate. They learn real world skills. And we all know what people on Farmville do, so I'll just skip that part. <laughs> Although, I can't say they create much value for the world, but some virtual strawberries look really good on the screen. <laughs> I uh, did a little back of envelope edit measurement of how much time people on English Wikipedia and, and WikiHow do per year. And it looks about 7.4 million hours of editing if you assume that each edit takes 10 minutes. Um, and that's a tremendous accomplishment, something we should be really proud of. However, when you compare that time with what's done in sort of world number two, it's very small. Uh, the middle box, the, the little dot on the left is wiki, wiki editing. The middle box is online gaming, and the, the large box is Facebooking. Of course, it's even worse if you compare it with the, the Grand Kahuna, which is TV. Again, that little itty bitty one pixel dot on the left is wiki editing. And I look at this, and I think this is a tragedy. We have, through wikis, we've invented something which makes everyone better, makes the individual better, makes society better, moves everyone up a notch. And yet, Somehow we haven't gotten to this huge mass of people who are making everyone stupider. It's something we, we should try and fix. And sadly, this problem seems to be getting worse. This is a famous chart, probably seen a lot of Wikipedians have seen this chart. This is the graph, the blue line is the graph of, of active wiki editors. Um, it's been declining, it peaked in 2007. It's been declining or flat ever since. And that same graph is more or less true on WikiHow. We peaked in 2007. There's, I have some theories about why 2007 was the magic year for wikis, but I won't go into those here. Um, uh, so we, we peaked, you know, we're much smaller than, than English Wikipedia. This is our, this is our people who do 100 edits or more a month. I should say article, main space edits a month. 
Uh, we peaked just over 50 and we went down to high 40s. Uh, I wasn't happy with those results and so I spent the last three years trying to build some features to turn that around. And we did. Um, in the past three years, we've almost doubled that. I'd like to get in now to talking about some of the features we built to do that. This first feature is called our community dashboard. I'll show you a little video of it working live. Uh, and what we tried to do here was try to put all the main wiki activities on one page so people could go there and say, hey, I'm bored, I got some time to, to help the wiki, what can I do? Uh, you could see across the top we have some of our more popular wiki activities, fixing spelling, patrolling recent changes, answering requests, which means writing new articles, add Im and then going down the second row, adding images, categorizing articles, formatting articles, expanding steps, guard quality, da da you get the picture. Um, you can also see we've done some things to, sh to put some numbers around these things. We found that people really like working down lists and knowing how much is in the backlog. You know, wiki work is a lot of working down backlogs, as everyone knows. Um, so some of these numbers have bigger backlogs than others. Um, articles, for example, articles, patrol recent changes. We have 837 unpatrolled edits on the wiki at the moment I took this, took this image. Some things we've already hit our goal. Former, formatting articles, we're down to zero. Uh, we've also put little weather reports up there to see, so people can get a sense of like, hey, what needs the most help right now? And finally, under the pictures, under the weather reports, we have pictures of people who are doing it. And you'll notice every few seconds these pictures change as someone actually goes and patrols a change or writes a new article. You can kind of see who's doing what on the wiki at any given time. Let me take you now into one of these tools. This is our tool to format articles. And uh, we base a lot of our tool development on WikiHow on this book by Michael Chick Sent Me High. I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly, called Flow. Uh, it's a great book, I re recommend it for everyone. Like a lot of positive psychology books reference this book. And what, what uh, Flo describes is this sort of frame of mind you get in when you're really enjoying something. You lose track of time, everything seems fun. Um, and when wiki editing is at its best, you're in that state of flow. And one of the things about being in flow is it really sucks to get out of the state of flow. So if you're distracted, you can get out of flow and you'll have a, you'll have a very hard time uh, sort of <laughs> Moving on. So one of the things we found is, uh, previous to these sort of article, these these features, if someone wanted to format format an article and really enjoyed formatting, finding that next article to format was hard. So this art this this feature is simple, in that once you format an article, you finish it. We just send it to the next article to format. Voila! You could keep going forever, doing a lot more formatting. Formatting is your thing. It's very easy to sort of keep it rolling. <laughs> I, I made these this morning. I haven't checked to see if someone reverted them. I really hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get into another one. This is a uh, this is our stub editing, and this is. Uh, this is it. Um, so the stub editing tool works a lot like the formatting tool I just showed you. You could go through various things. Uh, a little bit of change here. People want to form edit expand stubs in certain categories. So you can go, for example, this is a, a pictogram of the various different categories. I'm going to select hobbies and crafts and start editing there. It should show me a hobbies and craft article that's really sucky and hopefully I can improve it. So that's the idea there. So those are our flow tools and we found those work really well. You put people in a flow, people enjoy wiki editing, you don't distract them, they enjoy it more. Um, using, uh, with the insight from that, we built a new one called Quality Guardian. Quality Guardian is a new type of editing at WikiHow, which allows you to basically focus on certain things. Um, this particular example is about getting rid of images that aren't, that aren't a perfect match for the article. Um, so the person doing this tool will look, look at images. It says, is this the right image for this article? That big picture of onions about onion, make French onion dip. I'm gonna vote yes on this one. I like that one. And this article is about how to be kawaii. Um, kawaii, as far as I understand, and you learn these things on WikiHow, some sort of um, Japanese fashion. This to me didn't seem to fit it that well, so I voted no. And now you'll notice in the upper right corner of the screen, um, it shows that the, that image was removed because I voted no, someone else voted no, one person voted yes. Um, and putting that stuff up in the screen with the upper right corner showing who voted, and we have our icons for different people, we found that was really crucial. Before we had, when we first made this tool, we didn't have that social information about showing who did what and the tool was r much less engaging for users. There's really important social component of wikis. People like to know who's doing what, and we, so we found it really important to display that.
So with that, we are able to double our number of editors over the last three years. So now my question is, how are we going to double it again for the next three? Um, I'm going to show you some tools now that are in the very earliest stages of development. Uh, they're not really live on WikiHow other than very small test beds right now. But I'm, ex I'm excited about them. So here's one idea we have. Uh, one idea is, um, you know, I guess one of the things I've learned about wikis is people really want to contribute to wikis. People share our dreams. There's people share them, share uh, the idea of helping people. People want to help, but they get to they get to wikis. They press the edit button. They see all that complex wiki code, and they just go away. So we're trying to. We know there's people out there who want to help. We're trying to make it easy for them. Get it. Get them over that hurdle. So we tried this little experiment. We put this ad up on WikiHow. It says, hey, love spelling games. Help us find spell spelling mistakes. And when you click that, you get taken to this page, which is what we call the starter tool. <laughs> and it says, can you fix this sentence? And the blue, if you click the blue line, it says, yes, I certainly can. And then, or your other answer is, no, I'm not that awesome. <laughs> and we even highlight the spelling errors for the people. So people say, hey, like microwave is spelled wrong. I can fix it. And I should also add that we're a little tricky here. These aren't even real spelling errors. This isn't even text on WikiHow. We want to make this as easy as possible. And if someone messed it up, we didn't want them to mess up actual WikiHow. So these are just tests. Like we, we found very short things with very obvious spelling errors to put in for people. And then gave them cute little graphics. You know, this language isn't like your normal stuff on a wiki. It's very sort of fun. Um, and we tested this on folks. You go through three edits. If you successfully do the three edits correctly, we say, hey, we love you. Will you, will you do more of this? We, and then we ask you to register. Um, and we found that half the people we asked to register actually go through registration and then edit, real, edit the real live WikiHow. So we basically, this process is a process of taking someone who wants to help, get them confident enough to help in the actual wiki text, and then moving them on their way and gr basically graduating them to real WikiHow. So here's what we found when we did this. It, this is super small sample size, so I want to just throw a lot of, you know, this is not academic research. This is, this is very, very early on stuff. Um, we got 512 people to click the ad. 107 of those uh, made, you know, decided to complete the first edit. So in other words, 21% made the first edit, and the other 79% must have answered, I'm not that awesome. Um, and, and we lost people at every stage of the cycle, but you got down to, 2% actually made it to editing real WikiHow. And I want to say that 2% is huge. That's a huge conversion. So just to give an example of that, if we were to throw, throw an ad up on Wiki, Wiki, Wikipedia, we, uh, all the Wikimedia sites get 18 billion monthly page views. We throw this nice ad of Jimmy up saying, hey, please read, and then he, he writes this little thing, hey, please use my spell checker tool. If that ad only gets 0.03% click through, which is a very low click through rate, Jimmy can do much better than that. That's 108,000 new editors on Wikipedia, which doubles the number of active editors across Wikipedia. It's a huge deal. Um, and I think we could even do better. Let's say we run this ad instead. <coughs> now, again, this is not academic research, but this is my, this is my guess. I think we get 100% click through on that ad. <laughs> And I, I, I think we get every person on the planet editing a wiki after that. <laughs> so the next, the next, day, next place I want to go is mobile. Um, WikiHow already gets a third of its traffic from mobile. My guess is that within 18 months, we're going to have the majority of our readers coming to us via mobile phones. And it's a big opportunity. It's also a threat. People, people look at mobile phones and say, hey, it's really hard to edit there. But I think we just actually need to get more creative about how we get people to edit and what sort of editing people can do on a mobile phone. So we've tried a couple of tests. Um, I showed you the desktop version of the Quality Guardian, which is saying, you know, voting images, yes, no, this fits, no, this doesn't fit. Uh, we're gonna tr we tried the same thing on mobile. So you'll see on the left here it says, is this a good image for this article, yes or no? Oh, I should also say, we sit, first we give you this little ad on the top. It says, hey, we need your help, click here. If they click that, then we show them one of these things. Uh, and we found that when, if you click yes, we keep going, you click no, keep going, we, we'll, we'll give, show you as many of these things as we can. We found that if you cl click, the click the first one, 24% of you, 24% of the people actually get to do 10. So that's 10 edits, or sent, ten, not real edits, but 10 contributions that are done in a mobile environment. Again, those are huge, that's huge, huge, huge conversion. Um, 
I don't, my, my hunch is when we really start doing this, this is again in a very small test edit scenario, these numbers are going to go way down, so like temper your expectations about how effective this is going to be long term. But this is really, really promising stuff. We've also done the same thing on uh, article rating. We've ran three different types of article rating. Uh, one on the left, the traditional rate this one to five stars. The one in the middle, would you recommend this to a friend? And the third one, is this article helpful? And we also, we found people rated a lot of articles on their mobile phones. Uh, in the middle example being the best performing one, which is would you recommend this to a friend? We got 22% of people rating 10 articles right on their mobile phones. Again, these are all anonymous people. They don't know anything about WikiHow. Uh, the challenge will be to figure out how to bring these people into the community and have them contribute in a more ongoing fashion. Uh, so despite all that good news about finding things that actually seem to really work, I want to give a cautionary tale here. In the early days of WikiHow, I was really unhappy with the traditional Wiki talk page. Um, I looked at it and said, geez, this, this talk page thing sucks. I can't, I can't communicate on this. The whole discussion page thing is terrible. Um, let's just make, some, make this a lot simpler and we created this comment box concept. A you know, very similar thing you see all over the web. You know, you just, you, none of this talk page nonsense. You just go post your comment, you press post, and that's done. Uh, and I thought that would work really well. Um, but it had a lot of unforeseen negative consequences. Uh, what it's turned out is basically that it's made the discussion pages of articles not quite useless on WikiHow, but a lot less useful than the Wikipedia ones. So uh, on the left here, I took the Wikipedia talk page on French Kiss and the WikiHow talk page on French Kiss. Now, these are both pretty bad talk pages, but the Wikipedia one actually has some things that are helpful for editors of the article, whereas the WikiHow one, I mean, it's just terrible. I'm gonna read the top one, which I'm sure no one can read. It says, my boyfriend and I are badass kissers. <laughs> S spelled wrong, by the way. <laughs> Be it any kind of kiss, and sometimes we go too far. So that's, you know, it's not really helpful for, for, for readers, but it's, you know, this is the sort of thing that sometimes when you make, when you make contribution too easy, you gotta be really careful about quality, and there's some, you gotta balance these things out. Um, so the reason we haven't rolled those features we've, sh I've shown you earlier, is we gotta do a lot of work to make sure that we're gonna get the quality of the contribution we want. So that's the plan for the next three years, doing stuff like that to get us to another doubling. And now I'd like to talk about some other things I'm gonna call crazy ideas. And these aren't ideas that I, uh, I have planned to build on WikiHow, but I think there's something that, that Wiki should be doing. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is um, soundtracks. So I'm going to play a soundtrack, and I want you to think about the emotions that this soundtrack raises for you here. <laughs> I saw everyone smiling. The emotion is happy, it's fun, it's excitement. If you grew up in the 80s, 90s, or even recently, like that soundtrack, it means something to you. It, you may not have played that game in 20 years, but it still made you smile when you heard it. Um, and now I want to play um, the best wiki soundtrack ever used. I did a lot of research to find the best one, and here it is. That gets me right here every time. <laughs> the emotion in that is so powerful. It, well, of course, there is no wiki soundtrack. There's 13,000 wikis. As far as I can tell, not a single one has ever used a soundtrack. Um, but why not? Like, wikis, we have powerful emotions. Every, every edit we make, we're changing the world. We're making everyone smarter. There's a lot of emotion there. Why aren't we communicating that to our users? Why don't you get to WikiHow or Wikipedia and they're like, this is a big deal. This is really cool stuff. We have, a, we have a missed opportunity here. And so I've been wondering, why are there no wiki soundtracks? And I think it's because, because we all think wikis are really serious business. And it's true, wikis are serious business. What we're doing is important, it matters. Whether we succeed or fail really matters. But we shouldn't confuse serious with solemn. People contribute to wikis ultimately because they're fun. Yes, the mission matters. People start because the mission, but they stay because they're fun. We have our tradition at WikiHow, which I hope not ever see again, but I see it every day, which is, which is people get on the village pump and they're basically sick of WikiHow. And they say, hey, I love you WikiHow, but I'm moving on. And then they list why they're moving on. And it's never because I decided the mission sucks or 
I decided helping people doesn't matter to me. It's always, I found another website that was more fun, and I'm going to go there. So people stay on wikis because they're fun, and we, we, need to, we, need to, we need to let people have some fun and let them know that what they're doing is important. So with that, I'm going to finish up with my proposed soundtrack for Vandalism Patrol. <laughs> some, some copyright issues here, but hopefully we can get over those, and um, this, is, this is what I hope some wiki uses at some future point. Thanks for listening, by the way. And get this rolling. <laughs> All right, that's it, guys. <laughs> All right, I think there's questions now for the three presentations. Uh, right in front. Hi. Um, and now then. No Chinese version of Wiki how, but I think um, Wiki how is very important for China because China already has some five sites like Wiki how, but they are not free. But Wiki how is under the uh, Creative Commons is free total. So I think it is necessary to create the Chinese version. And if you want, uh, I can have, uh, have to do some translation work. That would be fantastic. In fact, we're something we're working on right now, so let's get in touch with this presentation. The Chinese Wiki House very high on our priority list. Ben in the back. Could you share a little of your theory about what happened in 2007? <laughs> so this is just a theory, but I think there was a lot of things that led up to 2007 being a great year for wikis. Um, the Seekin Thaler event. Uh, there's a ton of press. All of a sudden, that's when the press really noticed wikis, and negative and positive press. And all all press is good press. So all of a sudden, you know, when Jimmy went on CNN and saying, "Hey, I'm sorry, we, you know, turns out not every page in wiki is accurate," like everyone actually went to wiki to help. Um, uh, and that that press lasted for a while. Um, but then, you know, basically the internet got better. Like people started. You know, 2008 and so on, Facebook, I think, was the year Facebook sort of opened up to larger groups of people than college campuses. Um, there was other things to do to spend time on it, and we, we weren't keeping up in terms of, in terms of building features and tools to keep people active and, and happy, and the rest of the internet did. And so that's, I think, when we started going sideways. Hi. Uh, Wikimedia Feminist. Uh, sorry, it will be quite lengthy, so uh, at first, I really loved the topic of this presentation. I think it's one of the most important things actually that we're doing right now over here in this facility, so thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, firstly, what I have some concerns, uh, for instance with this music and uh, funny stuff, I think that it's something about the community experience. And I don't know, maybe it's a kind of a cultural difference, but for instance in Poland actually white people hated English Wikipedia was this funny, flurry, fluffy stuff. I don't know, giving flowers, giving barn stars, giving meat, giving whatever, giving beer, giving whatever. Actually, people, this hardcore community, really hated uh, these features. There are people who give barn stars, but actually, it's not really perceived as something highly popular. It's more about edit contosis, it's more about, I don't know, a little bit over showing off. It's more about, I don't know, hundreds and thousands of edits that people don't really like because they don't like. I don't know, editing one article with 30 edits just to, I don't know, just to pump up your edit counter. Um, the second thing is, for instance, with music, there was a social site that had a music, and it was MySpace. Facebook doesn't have a music, so, um, well, some people love it, some people uh, would have this, their experience range. So if you could customize it, just customize it that someone can turn it on, then probably it will be okay. But most of the people would hate it, especially, I don't know, for instance, academic community. Because after lolcats and, uh, I don't know, Imperial Death March, probably only efforts to get these people on board could be flashed away. Um, but, most, okay. So, yeah. I can make a comment on that. I mean, one that, I think the music, you know, one of the reasons I, I mentioned earlier I'm not working on the music thing is I don't think I can do it well. Um, I think it's a huge, I think this is an example of something where we, we bring emotion into the work we're doing. It's a big opportunity for wikis. Uh, I don't know how to do well. If I did, I, I'd be working on it. I, I agree that it's, it's hard, it'd be hard to get it perfect. 
you know, it, being too cutesy like Super Mario Brothers wouldn't work. Imperial Death March is kind of funny, but I I don't think we'd use that either. Um, yeah, because I like the I like and dislike the emotions because well, it gets some people motivated, especially I don't know high school or middle school students. Uh, but the problem is that these motivations cannot really be the motivations that we need because already we have noticed several year several several years ago that people who are not, I don't know for instance patrolling they just create some kind of a mindset. A mindset of people, I don't know, defending the Holy Wikipedia against some <coughs> some people, some newcomers who are coming and they are destroying and destructing their work. And um, I don't know, Imperial Death March could just, I don't know, enforce the mindset. So uh, I see some problem with that. And one more thing, because it's 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 great that you have increased the number of people who are making this 100 edits and more. That's great. But uh, my my concern is. How much is because that that you are now channeling people to make more and more of those small edits that you are in it because edit does not equal to edit. I like there is an edit like I don't know, uh, give the support sign and there's the edit like put the ready I don't know uh, featured article on the on the page and if you can do it in one edit if you really want. I, the uh, let me let me try and answer that one. I think there's a. Uh, one of the challenges we see is, is, is to tr try and bring people in. If we can get people to the 100 edit a month mm -hmm. range, then like, they're serious WikiHow editors, and they're going to do some of the deeper editing. I agree there's a, you know, I, and I haven't gone to measure to see do we lose sort of the deep editing in the process of doing this. Um, my sense is the WikiHow quality has been going up, so we haven't, but um, you know, we, we look at this like, hey, if we can get people to be a serious WikiHow editor, like, that's just good for the Wiki. And that's, you know, we try and make that happen. And that's your mind on the next question. Again, okay, we have sorry, sorry. questions for all three. Uh, can, one, I, can I answer another? Thing. another one minor thing. There's other people with questions. Yeah. Can also, I want to say there's three other presentations here to ask questions for as well. After, especially right. after this morning's talk, I wonder how you uh, thought about um, gender equality in. in yes. Um, in fact, that's going to be a conversation. There's a whole, Crystal, who's here in the room, is going to be giving a talk on gender equality at WikiHow um, on Saturday. And I'm happy to say WikiHow is almost 50-50 in terms of gender equality. It's a very different vibe than Wiki Wikipedia. Um, Crystal has some theories about why it's why we've been able to be a more general, uh, balanced wiki, and she'll be talking about that on Saturday. Um, so, uh, so all three of y'all are talking about people's motivations for doing stuff, and one of the major motivations we have in our society today is money, and it's also a really emotional thing and in my mind often a sinister thing and I wonder if any of you all think that, that um, the increasing involvement of money in wiki projects might have poisoned people or poisoned the, the whole thing for people or turned some people off um, like having paid employees of Wikimedia being more prominent having fundraising being more prominent having advertising being more prominent in other wikis uh, and so forth there you go. you're like the expert on this uh, I mean, that's that's a complicated question. There's been um, uh, so a lot of the so a lot of the psychological research that looks at payment actually looks at situations where they'll pay people to do something, and then looks like what those particular paid people do later. The idea of what happens when someone else is being paid to do something is a little bit complicated, and it's something which is actually a little bit less studied. There's a lot of research on like fairness and people like. People do want to be treated fairness fairly in generally, and sort of understanding what that means is interesting. Um, uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, so my background is in, um, in a lot of my research, and where I spent a lot of time was free and free and open source software communities, who uh, where there's a lot of money, like there's a ton of money, and a lot of people are paid to do that work. And um, I think that uh, you can. There's no shortages. Uh, there's no shortage of examples of communities that seem to be doing great. <coughs> And then, uh, like, basically did well, got some money, and like destroyed the community basically in the process of doing that. And there's also no shortage of examples who have really, you know, thrived in a situation where a bunch of people have been uh, paid to, to to do work as well. And I think that an important uh, a, an important thing for researchers to do, but also for people who care about these communities, to really understand the dynamics around those. I mean, I've, I've written some stuff about this. I've done a little bit of research, and I've done some just sort of writing on my own. I mean, you can check out my website, Mako. 
I need to make a make a .cc. Um, I've got some stuff there and links to some other work on the topic. But I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think that I think that that uh, it's it's important to uh, yeah the, the introduction of paid of, of, of payment can can change all kinds of stuff for the same reason that I mean like the stuff that I was talking about that, that I was showing about Scratch right. Like, like that's a kind of payment as well. I mean, in a sense, right? They're not getting paid in money; they're being paid in some sort of like social recognition, right? But like, from the perspective of some people in psychology and social psychology, the idea of sort of, sort of, uh, the, the important distinction is between is sort of like intrinsic, sort of internal forms of motivation and extrinsic stuff. In which case, it might be money or it might be praise. Um, but the, but there's there's a lot of evidence that they can work in the same way. So I think it's a great it's a great question, and it, I mean, I wish I had a short answer, but. Um, yeah, it's a it's an important concern, and it's something that we need to learn more about and be careful about. Uh, yeah. Can I follow up on that? Because I always thought people edited like Wikipedia because they enjoyed it, and I mean if that's that's my basis. And if you if you look at why people stop editing Wikipedia, I think it's either because they stopped enjoying it, or because they found something else that they enjoy more. Because what we're talking about here is people's free time, yeah. not, not paid employment. Surely that's just a tiny fraction of it. When you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, is the motivation not the enjoyment of doing that too? Well, I mean, the short answer is there's been lots of surveys about the motivations of Wikipedia contributors, and the answer is like all of the above, basically. Um, uh, so the answer is you're right, and so is everybody else here who's got a different idea. Um, uh, um, the, the, no, I mean, uh, but, but, but yeah, that, that, that in terms of the things that come up uh, frequently, that's, that's, that's always one of the things. Yeah, I mean, if you put it on a pie chart, isn't that like most The problem is the pie chart has more than 100%. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'll be around. It looks like I think we're probably yeah, over, right? We're all, around, we're all around the whole conference. Uh, I've got another talk later, and then there's this research thing on Saturday as well. So thanks for coming. Thanks for coming.